All right, you guys are on this call because you are the top 20% of our Eau Claire office, top 20% of our Fox Cities office and business centers, and the same thing with Green Bay. Um, uh, this is going to be a mastermind for you guys, so I need your participation. Um, I see some of you on here that I'm hoping will uh, kick in your advice because this literally is just going to be talking about what happened during 2008 to 2010 and then how a lot of you guys survived during that time. So I'm going to ask you guys some questions and then I'm actually going to turn it over to you guys and just kind of facilitate, but I'd like this to be a cultural event where you guys can learn from each other. Um, we're not face to face, but this is the next best thing with the world that we're in. Um, add value and wait, add value and add topics and things that you guys did during the last downturn to, um, uh, and let's just help each other. That's the whole point behind this call. So the first question I would like to ask you guys, and I'm hoping like maybe Jerry or the Battermans um, or Sandra, I'm hoping some of you guys will jump in on this question. Um, back in, you guys are the top 20% of our offices. So those of you who are in business into that from 2007 to 2012, if you've lived through that, um, let's talk about it. What did you do during that time <laughs> that um, helped you keep your mindset strong when the market shifted really hard? Can some people share? Well, I went through it at that time and it was, uh, <clears throat> you know, you, you didn't know when it was gonna end. So you just kept thinking, you know, let's just keep going, keep going. going. It took forever. Um, and so we ended up having to, uh, we didn't, we didn't lay anybody off, but we started limiting their times. You know, we had uh, people coming in like four days a week and then three days a week. And we just kept, kept things going. It cost us a lot of money. But um, when we got, when we got through the shift, we did have our team in place. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's, I don't think there's any great solution. I think you just got to keep going, you know, don't, don't get down. Um, just, Think about it as it's probably going to end next week or next month or whatever it might be. So, so you um, showed up, Jerry, every day, and you just worked. You just kept your strong work ethic. You tried to keep your mind your mind sharp in terms of point that it could end at any minute, um, and that you just didn't know how long it was going to take. But you just kept your work ethic up, and you pulled out of that just fine, right? Yeah, we didn't uh, we didn't stop. We we worked as harder harder, you know. So what are you, Jerry, what are you doing right now that um, we're, we're supposedly quarantined and, you know, how are you doing things now? Well, here, here's my thought on it. I, I, I get into all my leads and, and, and the people I've been showing properties to, and I try to talk to them because my theory is, is that when we come out of this thing, I want to, I want to, uh, 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 my funnel full of people so that we can, you know, really accelerate and, uh, I, I don't think, you know, you, you want to, you know, keep in touch with them people because they're your future business. And I'm hoping that, you know, we, we're, we're hoping we can do six, you know, one year of business in six months, you know, okay. so you're keeping because your sharp. I know people are going to lay down. Um, they, they did it before and uh, there's going to be some great opportunities. I, I feel so that's what we're awesome. doing. Hopefully it works. <laughs> it will. No, I completely agree. I believe that people will um, lay down right now. Agents will, they're going to use this as an excuse. A lot of them are going to get out of the business, but the, but the top 20%, I think I can tell from people's body language and their faces, they're working. So Kim, what did you have? Caleb, can I share? Oh. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I've been in it a long time, like Jerry, like 40 years. And I've gone through that 18% interest rate and then 9-11 and, and then the you... 2007 and now the virus and pattern, the 18% was all about interest and the 9-11 was about fear. Uh, the 2007 was also about, you know, recovering uh, economically and the virus is all about fear and there's, it's very, very different. Um, so my, what I learned, <laughs> I started in 1980, I went to a GRI class. And they said, if you want to be successful in this business, do everything everybody else is not doing. So I came back and every, no, you know, agents that 
uh, I call them fat cats. They didn't want to work on Sundays. They didn't want to work. Uh, they didn't want to do this. They didn't want to work on hard ones. So uh, in 1980, I sold um, over a million dollars. And um, um, and back then, that was a lot. And so I got a taste of what success was, is to do what everybody else is not doing. And in 2007 to eight, it was fun for me because as you're all saying here, the, um, I call them the bottom feeders or the fat cats, they all bail. And what you need to do is do what you're doing, figure out what you do well and do it a lot. And I'm going to tell you the answer to that is to get listings. Um, what I do is my shift, and I love Kelly Williams because their model is just top shelf. Shift is not to stop, um, not to, you know, like you're gonna shift your expenses, like Caleb said yesterday. Um, you wanna be lean and mean, you should always be lean and mean. Um, if you're gonna be in the top 20, you are lean and mean. Um, so that, uh, just presuming that's what you're doing, you still have expenses. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna shift those expenses to what um, maybe others aren't doing or what you can do better than anybody else. Very good, thank you, Linda. Kim, you were gonna add something. Sandra Kamen. I was gonna say prospect. I mean, what, what a lot of us do because it's easier is we market. So we, we use our social media marketing. Maybe we've taken out, out some ads somewhere, especially Linda, where she's at, that probably is profitable for her with the, uh, the recreational type uh, situation. But a lot of us will do the things that are simpler when business is flowing. Because literally in the past couple of years, you could stand on the corner with a sign that said, I'm a realtor and someone would probably stop and say, hey, I need your, your services, right? And then it gets, we get out of the habit of prospecting. So now it's our opportunity to get back to our database, to do what Gary Keller tells us to do anyway, and that's lead generate for about three, maybe even four hours a day to check on everybody, see how they're doing, um, invite people to Red Day, have a couple of events scheduled where you can in invite other people to come and participate with you, and it gives you an opportunity to ask them for referrals and teach them how to give you referrals. That's the other thing is they want to... They want to be able to say, hey, I've got a great realtor and I want you to talk to them when they hear that someone's buying or selling, but they don't always know what to tell them or how to do it. So you have to spend a little bit of time teaching them and you'll have more time to talk to people on the phone if you're doing less business. But we'll have a, a small period of time in 2006, 7, 8, the market I was in, 51% was new construction and literally new construction went away. 75% of the deals we did in 2010 and 11 were short sale or foreclosure properties. That's a pretty, and the, we did thousands of them. So you, so you, real so quick, you went from doing new construction, I think you said it's 58% of your business. 51. 51%, okay. So then, you, so then you immediately, as soon as that, that market shifted, you realized that that was gone and then you shifted your company at that point. Yeah, we went and got certified for distressed properties immediately. Hired an attorney to do our short sale properties and just moved forward because it was you were going to have short sales and foreclosures everywhere. So you got to kind of look ahead and say, what are we going to see? And I think one of the things we're going to see is a lot of panicked sellers who come on the market because they were waiting for that perfect time. And now they realize it's probably past. So they're all thinking, holy crap, do I get in before everybody else gets in and we turn to a buyer's market? And I was not, I didn't want to have to paint those walls or replace that carpet. If I don't get sold now, I'm going to have to do that. So there, we're going to see some more inventory come forward. If indeed we reach out, if we prospect to them and say, here's the situation, you know, we're probably shifting into a buyer's market. It, it maybe is your time to shine. Let's, let's talk about that. Let's get together and move it forward. Okay. Is there any other, um, anything else anybody else would like to add in around mindset and in around Can I the shift? My comment? Yeah, sorry, Linda. I thought you were done. Yeah. It's getting a little skippy on my end. No, I'm never done. You always have to cut me off. <laughs> okay. When I was on vacation, I read the one thing, frontwards, backwards. It's, it's, I need to get another book. It's all worked up. Um, what I would su suggest is everybody figure out what your one thing is and, and focus on it and do it well. And that's how you're going to get through this. Very good. Thank you. Um, what did you guys do? So those of you who lived with it, because there's a lot of people on the call that have not been through a hard market shift yet. We touched on it a little bit. Tell me more about what you guys did at that moment with your business expenses. Can some people tear in and around that? I spent more. You spend more on what? 
by one thing, and that's always advertising that I can get their property sold. So you spent a lot more money advertising to get listings. Not a lot. I All right, I'm losing you. Shift in my market, pull back. I just advertise more. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's just it's getting choppy on my end, so I'm not sure where it ends or not. Um, what else did you guys do with expenses? I, Jerry, I heard you said yeah. you got some things. Joe. Yeah, well, yeah. we 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 cut the fat. We cut the fat, but we you, you know to get deals, you gotta you gotta get you have to go after with the marketing and and like Linda said, you gotta spend some money too. If you're running scared, you're just gonna reduce to nothing. So um, that's kind of what we did. We cut the fat that we did not need, but then we went after it with the uh, with heavy marketing. That's interesting. So a lot of you guys showed up. Um, uh, really super focused on what's most important, which is the listings. And it's going to be right through this market downturn. And you guys leaned into that and said, you know what, I'm going to be more aggressive with not spend a ton, but I'm just going to make sure everything that I'm spending money on points towards that one thing to Linda's point. I can, I can tell you one thing that I can tell you some things not to do. Okay. That's <laughs> fair right. Appreciate that. Okay. Well, you know, like we, we had, uh, we, we, we had a, uh, ton of newsletters going out at the time. You know, there were snail mail newsletters. I had probably 1,100 people on it. And I was cutting fat. And I'm, I'm going to cut this out. You know, looking back at that, that was probably the, the worst thing that I could have done. You know, I should have kept my uh, my sphere of influence. I think I would have came out of it a lot better. Second thing I, I did was I, I should have probably laid some people off. And, uh, and I didn't do that. And that cost me some money. Um, so, you know, it, you got to do some pretty hard things right now. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think you got to look and see like Caleb <laughs> you were talking about yesterday, what can make you three times more than, than what you're spending. And uh, um, I, I'm just saying, you know, if you're, if you're doing some marketing to past customers, definitely try to try to keep that in the budget. Yeah. What we were talking about. Who would you lay off, yeah. Jerry? Well, <clears throat> what happened is I didn't need all them people, you know. Um, yeah, what, what do we have? Eight people on staff or something or seven people on staff? Yeah, we had, we had, uh, we had too many. And, and I, I ended up, you know, we, we had people doing, you know, of course, putting up our signs, you know. And, and <laughs> so, I mean, we can do that ourselves. We got trucks, whatever it might be. We had people that were out taking pictures. I mean, we can take our own pictures, you know. Uh, we, we had, uh, we, we had people, you know, couriers and I think, you know, we can do our own courier stuff, you know, uh, we had, uh, um, you know, like right now yeah. we're pretty lean. We, we have, you know, like, uh, inside sales. I'm not going to get rid of my inside sales. That that's, that's business. She's calling every day. She's booking appointments, you know, um, I do have an assistant right now that's, uh, you know, takes care of our contracts and stuff. You know, she's kind of like uh, that. That'd be something we could maybe do ourselves. So we're we're, we're looking at that a little bit. We do have a, a closing coordinator, um, you know, and uh, we're going to keep her on because I think the second half we're going to make up for everything here. We're going to need, you know, because we're hoping to close a hundred, maybe 120, 130 deals second half. We're hoping for it. So you know, it, it's just. There's no right or wrong. I guess I, I just think you should look at it, you know. Got it. Yeah. All right. What else do people do with expenses? I think it's interesting that the that two of you automatically said that you, you spend more on the most important things like um, getting more listings. But um, how about you, Sandra? It looked like you were going to say something um, for when you got went through it. Um, one of the things that I'm really doing back to the expenses thing and the marketing piece is really looking at what it is that I do best and the one thing piece, they all kind of work together, but really, really figuring out what is my message and then finding the best avenues and the best people to help me communicate that message. I think that right now, I think somebody else had mentioned anybody that had a sign was getting business, but right now is, I really feel like when we went through the, I've only gone through the 9-11 forward stuff, so what I, when those things were happening, the people with the deep skill sets came out, the people that were in it to win it, not just in it to make the money. So I, what I did in those situations that I'm doing right now is really focus on 
A, the background stuff of what am I doing marketing wise? Where's my business? Like Caleb and I had a discussion a couple of days ago, not about this current situation, but about my business as a whole. Okay, I've been in business, you know, 20 some years. It's, this is what's happening. This is what needs to happen in the next five years. So what does that look like for me? So there's that going on in the background, but in the immediate, when it's all crazy and this is super fear-based for everybody, including myself, I don't want my family to get sick. This is a whole new thing. I'm focusing on the business at hand and really hyper serving those people right now that have to buy and sell. We've got several of those clients and I'm using that time that I could be worrying, really thinking, well, how can I extra serve these people? So that's how I've been. That's how I've handled the past. I've just one foot in front of the other. I show up every day. I try to be better. I reach out. I get the hell out of my comfort zone and just keep on going. That's what I do. Thank you. Get out of your comfort zone, I think is huge right now. Hey, look, right can now. I say something? Um, yeah, Susan, absolutely. Um, I agree with Ms. Sandra. I, I was from 9-11 on too with the, in this century. And I too, I actually really went back to my database and I cut all advertising unless it was something for my listing. I never even advertised myself, but I just went back to my database and doubled down um, if I was doing two hours of lead gen, I was doing four. If I was making 20 calls, contacts a day, it was 40 contacts a day. And I also went after the expireds. Um, and I got so good at ex listing expireds and, um, and talking to those sellers and getting them to understand that if they are going to sell in that market, that we had to price it under what their neighbor's house was priced at. And so I got really good at that where I was able to um, have number of days on market was less as well. And, um, and so that's what I did. In fact, I joined Keller Williams in 2010, fall of 10, and um, the market was still a little soft. And I left 36 listings um, with my previous broker because I knew I could do it all over again. And I believed in KW. Wow. Well, great. We're glad you made that change. And um, I think it's really interesting. I'm hearing two, I'm hearing two stories right now. I'm hearing um, we had to completely shift like Kim did because she was in new construction. She had to completely shift out of there, get into short sales and foreclosures. And then I'm hearing an, another end top producer saying, Hey, we just really tightened up what we did really, really well. And we, and we went full steam into that and we just kept the value and kept going um, because we knew we were good at, we know what it, it got us there. We just upped the activity. It's, it's, it's kind of interesting. We're hearing the two, the two sides of it. Um, what, what did you guys do in terms of leverage? Like I know Jerry had mentioned, like they're like, we could have went and put up our own signs. Did you guys bring any leverage points into your business um, during the last shift? Did anybody actually make a hire or at least coming out of it that really helped them or really define their business on coming out of a shift? I did. Um, I hired an admin at that point because it was just me as a solo agent and um, and she had been she was with me for three years and then moved on to other things. But yes, and I'm I'm gearing to or, uh, to hire another admin at this point, too. OK, so you lean you doubled your lead, Jen, and then all of a sudden you said I need some help um, with yeah, the business yes. because you came out of it. OK, awesome. Yes. Anybody else? I mean, my advice, I, I, we're not going to hire anyone right now, but if you're looking at some, someone to hire, I would say someone that's the direct um, correlation of, of getting money in your pocket. So like an inside sales would be a good hire or an assistant would be a good hire if, if uh, you need some help and to leverage that person. Um, I guess that would be my advice on it right now. Yeah, and um, this is one point that I want to bring up for any of you guys that have anybody inside your organization um, on your team. Uh, at this point in a market in my business, every single person is outbound sales. Not just me, not just the rainmaker. If you're inside our organization, you are outbound sales. I don't care who it is. It's a fight for survival. You know, you want to hold on to people. It's like, great, game's changed. Now I need your help. And um, we're all outbound sales. We are all looking for bringing business in. If you help me with transactions, well, that's great. But who do you know at work or church that could is looking to buy or sell real estate, right? That's their, that their, have them buy into the fact that Jerry and his team want to sell 130 listings in the second half. Does the entire team know that? Do they understand that they're part of that as well? Um, 
Where did you guys go to find motivation? Because motivation is key right now. We're still doing business. I'm still watching the closings happen. I mean, we're still, we're, we're, I can't believe actually um, how much uh, business is actually still happening. I do believe that the people going forward are gonna be the motivated. What do you guys do to find the motivation? Find the listings to find the buyers that are motivated. Well, we've done this consistently in the recent years and it's been very successful. I didn't do it in 2007 because I wasn't this organized, but we have a pre-qualification sheet. So the very first thing you do when you call an expired or when you call for sale by owner or someone who has been referred to you is, you know, you have your brief um, conversation and then you get right into their contact information. And as soon as you get into contact information, it gets them talking. So now you ask questions like, if you don't sell your house in the amount of time that you'd like to, what happens? Why do you really want to sell your house? What's the purpose? What's your underlying motivation? Who's most interested? You, your wife, both of you, you know, kind of going through that kind of thing. And then we ask them on a scale of one to 10, how motivated did they feel? Did they think that 10, I got to sell this house and I got to sell it this year? Or two, I'm hoping if I can get best price um, that I'll get it sold this year. So you can really identify where they're at and just be bold with them. If they don't say they're seven or more, they're probably not motivated enough to sell in this market. So it's like, you know, you, you probably aren't in a position where it's going to be to your advantage. Let's stay in touch. Um, we go to the house if we can and give them advice on what actions they should take so they can maximize their asset value and stay with them over time. And when the time is right, you'll have that opportunity when they get to that seven to 10. But don't mess around with the fours and fives when you're in that position. All right, and, so you help, you're, you're, you're finding the motivation by asking really good, powerful questions. And mm -hmm. it actually just starts out with, Give me your name and phone number so I can plug you in my database and keep you up to date. And then you get into the deeper questions as you go. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't even usually ask them. So I call you up and I say, hey, Caleb, this is Kim Batterman with the Batterman Integrity Group. And I see that your property was on the market for about six months. And last week, it went off the market on our multiple listing system. We call that an expired situation. I'm just wondering, are you still interested in selling the property? And you've probably heard that a hundred times. And they go, yeah, yeah, I'm interested. And yes, you have, you're my 40th person, right? And I said, okay. I said, great. I said, well, there's always a reason why somebody didn't sell. And in, this, in, in the previous market, we had a seller's market going on. So I'm, I'm surprised. So I'd, I'd love to see the property so I could give you the advice that you need to put you in the position to sell your property. But I've got a few questions first. And I just go, hey, what's your email? What's your telephone number? I've got your address. Do you have another cell number? Is it okay to call you at work? I mean, you just go through a bunch of questions and they start answering them. They don't even ask. They just answer them. And once you get through with that, you can go right into, okay, so what's your motivation to sell? Why are you selling? And why do you think the house didn't sell? If you put it back on the market for six months and, and it's not moving forward, you know, what, what else can we do? What else are you willing and interested in doing? On a scale of one to 10, how important is this, is selling your house in this next year to you? And it's amazing. They usually answer most all the questions. You can tell when they start to get annoyed, that's when you kind of back off and get into a little bit more small talk and try to get the appointment. Okay. Okay. All right, thank you, Kim. Uh, what else, what are people doing to find motivated buyers, sellers right now, or what did they do last, during the last downturn that they found really, really useful? We're, uh, we're, 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 we're still using uh, Facebook and uh, um, we're, we're still using pay-per-clicks uh, for leads and we're following up on all of them. Um, it's still, uh, you know, it's still really only 25% of the business, you know, but um, um, we're finding buyers and sellers in there. And then, you know, of course, our past customers is like, I, I think we looked at the other day uh, in a, in a, in a two month period, there's 85% were past customers. So, um, and, and sphere of influences. So, you know, that, that's definitely hugely important, but we're still buying leads, you know, and we're working them, we're calling them. You know how it is. You get on the phone, something's going to happen. Yeah, you catch them in your web, Jerry, and then you start just working and um, uh, adding value and talking to them. Um, what are you guys doing um, to stand out from the competition? So uh, anything, any tips or anything that can separate you from maybe somebody who's not in the top 20% or just to help you with your business? What are you guys doing to stand out, uh, especially right now? Or what did you do during that time to stand out uh, during the last shift? In my market, um, I'm sorry, am I echoing? No, you're good, Susan. Okay, I hear an echo on my end. So in my market, I do a pre-list packet, which no one else does. Uh, so that really stands me out, um, helps me stand out. And I've been delivering them uh, quite frequently now. There's a lot of expireds here, and I'm picking up expires again. 
So pre-list packet is very important. And, um, and, and in the last two weeks with what's been going on with the virus, I'm actually doing Zoom calls now with these, um, these sellers and they're very appreciative of that. Good, very good. Um, what about urgency? Is anybody doing like, um, has anybody helped? The, is anybody doing, what do you guys do to create urgency right now in and around with people listing? Or um, is there any scripts that you guys are using to help them maybe understand that you can keep them safe while listing their house today? Like, what are you guys doing to, you know, I'm sure that there, you guys, some of you had conversations where people are like, well, I just want to wait. Is anybody saying anything that helps put their mind at ease or helps protect them during this time? We only know what the market is today and we know what your equity is by putting your house on the market today and we know that we have pre-approved pre buyers that aren't affected and what we don't know is what the market's going to look 30, 60, 90, 180 days from now. Awesome. So you're creating that urgency right away going, we know what it's doing right now, but we don't know what it's going to be in 30, 60, 90 days from today. Is that, do I understand that correctly? Right. Yeah, that's And that's great. really helping getting these sellers into action that are just, oh, I just want to paint one more wall. Don't worry about it. No one's going to be looking at that anyway. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know. At least know not right now, right? Right. Right. <laughs> Um, you know, one script that I did use uh, for a friend, um, a friend of mine that called and he's like, hey, I wanted to list this rental, um, but he's like, with all this going on, I'm not so sure. And I was like, well, if you're feeling like you don't want to list it because of everything that's going on, I assure you there's a lot of other people that feel the same way. And so what will happen is, is if you put yours out there, there's probably 10 people that won't put inventory out there. And if you put yours out there, um, you know, it might help you get more money for your property today because most people are waiting. I just listed three properties and the sellers are worried about people bringing the virus into their home. And so I have everything all set up. I have everything measured, pictures taken, everything. And we put a provision in there that there's no showings on it until um, the governor does uh, takes away the stay. And what I found on that first step, then it gets real easy. It's their fear step first. Um, and it's just been working for me. I've got 14 more listings that I'm working on one at a time, but it's ta it takes a lot of hand holding. And um, you cut you cut up, Linda. Could you say the part again? Finding where out you... where their fear level is, and like I think, yeah, yeah your, connect, your connection on your end is it. I keep losing you, Linda. I'm sorry. Um, I'm happy on this, Caleb. Yeah. What do you got? What do you got, Sandra? Um, one of the things that's been really helpful to the, uh, the sellers that I'm working with right now is I've talked to them about right now in any given market, there are always, you know, traditionally like three sets of buyers in the market, the have to's, the want to's and the investors. Typically people fall under one of those categories. Right now, the investors are kind of holding like really not in, really not out. The want to people because of the low interest rates are on the sidelines, the have to's are buying. That's what our business right now, it's death, divorce, relocation. Those people are still in the market and we have such a shortage of inventory that listing right now, you have a, I feel like you have a massive opportunity. So I have people fast tracking to list right now to capitalize on that opportunity. It's a really, honestly, all this craziness aside, it is an amazing time to list. It's great. So that's what I've been using. Yeah, there is a gift in it. And in every shift, there is a gift. And we have to train our brains to look for that gift, look for that opportunity um, and to take advantage of the current situation to just help us. And that's, I think, a great, um, a, a great point, Sandra. Thank you very much. Yeah, Caleb, I think Go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, let's go with Brian and then I'll, I'll go. Um, Brian, can you finish your thought? Sure. Yeah. Uh, what we're using in, in, in terms of driving some urgency is talking about how the buyer pool, sort of what Sandra was saying, some of the buyer pool is drying up. So relative to the inventory itself, we're going to see more of a balance of inventory against the buyers that are out there uh, shifting more toward a neutral market or a buyer's market. So it's not that the, the market is, the market itself is getting smaller, right, is what I'm saying. And so we're driving the urgency to say that we're going to be coming out of the seller's market because there's going to be less of a buyer's pool out there. So get out there now before that dries up. Great. Absolutely. Um, somebody else was going to chip in too, and I, I couldn't see who it was. Hi, it's Brandy. I was just wondering um, if we could maybe jump back to Linda. Uh, I was really interested to hear her thoughts. She was saying that they restricted no showings till the governor lifts the ban. And I was wondering uh, the rest of that, if she was 
getting offers on scene or if she was just kind of doing basically like a major, almost like a major coming soon, building that up to then anticipate uh, a lot of activity when it comes off. And one tip, if you've got low bandwidth, Linda, as much as we love to see you, um, if you want to try turning off your video first and just see, then we might be able to pick up just the audio. I know that's worked in other Zooms I've done, so maybe we could try that. Yeah, it was cut. It was breaking up on you, Alinda. Um, as you, but if you could re um, reiterate the, uh, her question and um, answer that, that'd be amazing. Okay, um, I'm just shifting, so I don't know all the answers, but I'm <laughs> I'm feeling so confident that this is going to work because people are basically people, and once you get that listing, um, you've already um, gotten past their fears, their biggest fear. Um, and then now I know with, let's say it's Mike and uh, Heidi, they're in Arizona and they're sitting there wanting to get this waterfront property on the market. And they said, Linda, th is this a good time? And I said, what are you talking about? It's a perfect time. And so I go through my whole spiel and Heidi's like, well, what are we going to do with all those germs in our house? And I said, I don't know. What should we do with all those germs in our house? Mike said, who cares? So I know I have a motivation there. So I said, what do you want to do, Heidi? What would make you feel comfortable? She said, I don't want any showings on it, except you, Linda. I said, really? So I can take a buyer in there with germs and no one else can? And she said, yeah, I would be okay with that. So I will guarantee you, and, and I said, okay, I'm gonna put that in your listing contract. Um, and you know, I, I'm not gonna elaborate on all I did unless you wanna to talk to me on a one-on-one. -on -one. And I'll guarantee you in another few days here, it'll get a little bit better. And then pretty soon she'll have me opened up to the market. Just Very kind good. of like easing into their fears. Um, I'm, I'm just super, super excited. I've got some really good virtual uh, 3D tours planned and um, I'm, I'm pretty excited. Awesome, thank you, Linda. Um, Sandra, what was your, what would you wanna bring up? Just to piggyback on that, what we've done with our both buyers and sellers is we've really employed the 3D Matterport tour thing for our listings. We've gotten showings off of that. And then we've also been doing, I'm sure everybody has been doing this, we've been doing FaceTime showings. So that, and we've, and Amy Jo sold sight unseen to a person that has to come here that needs a house by the end of May. They bought it through a FaceTime tour. They did the inspection through FaceTime. I mean, we've just been utilizing all of those virtual tours and they've been working beautifully, absolutely beautifully. So, and the germ thing, like when we staged a house this, this past week, we had our gloves on, we had Clorox on, the people were, I mean, we, you just kind of do what you have to do to put their mind at ease. And it's pretty easy to put their mind at ease if they trust you. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, you guys, I'm gonna ask you kind of a, um, I'm gonna ask you a more personal question and get off the topic of production. We got a lot of smart people on this call. What, so those of you who went through your, or went through this, went through the last shift, what is, what do you wish you would have done in 2008, 2009, 2010, that you know now, what is it, what's one thing you wish you would have kind of, if you could go back to tell yourself to get done during that time, what would that be? I would have hired a second assistant and had her do uh, more of the things that are time consuming um, and me focus more on more listings and more business. I totally agree with Linda. What we tend to do when we get into a shifted market is we go back to that single agent mentality and I call them $10 an hour jobs, but you guys all know they're now $20 an hour jobs. That just dates how long they've been around. But uh, you know, we used to pay the assistants, we used to pay the sign people, Jerry was talking a little bit about them, and all of them got, you know, 10 or maybe $15 an hour now. Um, those kind of jobs are not the kind of jobs you want to be doing. You want to be doing the $150 per job, which is, means you're making phone calls, you're reaching out to people, you're talking on Zoom, you're having Zoom conversations or some kind of video conversations, you're doing your social marketing, the stuff that makes you money and the prospecting that makes you money, not the paperwork that doesn't. Absolutely. You actually lean, because I think what happens a lot of time when fear goes up, when fear is really high uh, um, and emotions is really high, logic is low. And what we typically run tend to do to Linda's other point was we tend to go back to our comfort zone 
of doing some of those um, those jobs. And what you guys are saying, and what I think I'm hearing, is is lean into it a little bit. And even though it's uncomfortable, keep getting uncomfortable and keep investing in your business and keep moving forward. All right, what else? What do you guys wish you had told yourself back then? Because we're in it now. Just double down on the calls. Double, double down, down on them. Region. Okay. Yep. Yep. I, I think the, the one thing that uh, we should think about is like what, what you said, um, you know, we, we have like inside sales uh, and we're happy about that. And that's the one thing we didn't really have last time. And then everybody in the office um, was still doing their own duties that, you know, we, we didn't have a lot of business, so they weren't that busy. And we should have been doing like what you said, Caleb, you know, everybody's a, everybody's a salesperson. Everybody has to um, survive. So you're going to have to look and see, help us, help us get listings, help us get sales. You know, I think that's one thing I didn't do last time. And that's some, something we're going to work this time. Awesome. Awesome. All right. What about, um, I'm going to take it, I'm going to take it to building wealth. What is, what do you wish you guys would have known or done to set you up in a better financial position um, today that you wish you would have done during the last term? I wish I would have invested in properties. Um, I missed out on a lot. I listed several and I just did not get into it. And um, I, my husband and I have the mindset of now this time we're going to get into that. Okay. So you wish you would have invested more? Thank you. Yes. Anybody else feel that way? So it's hard for me to go through and relate because obviously I wasn't around um, in real estate when everything happened back in 2008, 9, and 10. Um, one thing that I've really been leaning into though um, has been studying some of the people who have been making very large uh, amounts of wealth over and through those time periods. So obviously the stereotypical one is uh, outside of Caleb is Warren Buffett. Um, and one of the things that he said that really sticks through for me is when people are fearful um, or be fearful when others are greedy and when others are greedy or be fearful when others are greedy and when others are fearful, be greedy. So like in this time, this is the exact time that we should be leaning into um, leaning into the fear that other people have. So if you are going on those appointments where somebody is um, not sure whether they should make those additional repairs or paint the walls um, to make the money for somebody else, they talked about it at family reunion in the past couple of years. Why not look at that as a purchase for yourself in terms of investment? Um, we very quickly go into that for the short term profit of five to ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars for selling it, as opposed to finding a way to purchase it and then use that to build your wealth and your net worth. So just my thoughts. No, thank you for that. That's going to lead me into my next point or my next question. Um, but uh, to, to your point, Alex, and um, thanks for jumping in, is that the only houses that we should list are the ones that we didn't, we chose not to buy. Uh, Gary Keller teaches us that. I've learned that um, at Family Reunion over and over. And um, I think that applies now or it's going to apply in the future going forward. But, but for those of you, okay, we've heard from a lot of the people that have, um, they're the survivors, right? They came through the last shift. But those of you, um, I'm going to open this up to now people that weren't a part of the last shift. So the people that weren't in the business in eight to 2008 to 2012, if you weren't in the business at that point, but yet you got questions for these guys, um, ask away. What do you got? What is something that you want to know about? Hi, Caleb. Hey, Aaron. Hi. So I guess I, would, I started in real estate in 2010. So I guess I was sort of part of that, but um, like the way that I did my business then is not how I do it now. I don't cold call. I don't call expireds. I don't do any of that. I know shame on me, whatever. That's how I do it. Um, I do just different forms of marketing that are less cold and that's just what I'm more comfortable doing. So I guess for me, first of all, is what are you guys doing to get through this? For those of you that don't necessarily make 50 phone calls a day, call the expires and for sale by owners. And then second of all, those of you guys that are team leaders, what are you telling your agents when they're coming to you freaking out? You know, there's the, the message that we give to our buyers and sellers is different than the one that we have to give to our agents. So I'm just curious what you guys um, are doing there. Thank you, Aaron. Um, so the first, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. The first question you have for everybody is, um, 
if you're not pounding the phones, how do I get business? Is that the first question? Basic, basically, yeah. Like, you know, everybody on here was saying, you know, oh, in 2008, I doubled down on my phone calls. I called expireds. You know, obviously, we're in a seller's market. Expireds, there's just, there's not that many of them. Most of them aren't getting to that point, you know, and, you know, I guess I'm just wondering what other people are doing to generate business um, that, you know, they're not doubling down on the expireds or the for sale by owners. Awesome. All right. Who wants to take that? I mean, I could take it. I think that you just got to get a strong sphere uh, of influence and past client database system going and um, take advantage of that. Um, I, I do a lot of bomb bomb videos too. So like I talk to a lot of people on there and people love that, that personal feel. Um, I just send out emails to them. Um, but I, I think, you know, if you're not going to make a ton of calls, I think those are the most important people to, to stay, you know, stay with. Otherwise you're going to, you know, I, I think that's probably your easiest business. Awesome. One thing that I've been leaning into, and I know Sandra mentioned it as well, is leaning into the activities that give you the personality and the connection. So similar to the bomb bomb, um, I very much have been leaning into what that 20% of activities are that have been generating the 80% of the business. So if it is going to be video, Aaron, I know that you um, do a lot of activities where you are in front of the camera and providing that personal touch. I think that's the one thing that a lot of people are missing out on right now is just that uh, personal connection. So I think right now is a really, really good time to lean into um, video, video conferencing, Facebook Lives, what YouTube, whatever that might be that gets your face and your voice in front of others, um, as opposed to just doing calls are still going to be critical text emails, but I think showing that you are going through it with your family um, and your team, but then leaning into how you can connect like calls like this via zoom, um, Google Hangouts, whatever it might be. One of the things I thought was interesting that I saw in another group was hosting a virtual happy hour. I think that's something where you could go through, you could reach out to your specific sphere of influence and say, you know what, I'm gonna go through and host a virtual happy hour for all my past clients. This is how it's gonna go through and function. And maybe it's something as simple as um, trying to think where you could send them, I don't know, uh, coffee to have at home or tea or something to each of the clients where it's a small monetary amount, but it allows you the chance to not only follow up with them, but then set a dedicated time to where, you know what, I'm going to make myself available from, uh, 10 to 11 a.m. Mondays and Thursdays to answer your questions. Here's a Zoom conference uh, link. Post it and blast it out to all of your sphere of influence and then make yourself available. Even if you're doing regular paperwork and emails, make yourself available so that somebody can just pop in for five minutes if they have a question about the market or real estate, but then just showing that you are there regardless of the time. You're so right. smart, Alex. Oh, Thank you. I can, I can chime in. I have a little different um, situation because I was in the business in 2007, 8, 9, 10, but I was an admin at that time. And this is the first time I'm going through it with as being a team lead. And we are very much re relationship based. And so when I was a, a I was basically a buyer's agent, but in a weird position that I was never encouraged to market myself. So I did everything under the team and I had zero recognition when I closed. But one of the things through the shift is I did, I worked for two very big agents and we had a lot of listings. So I was in charge of all the open houses. I scheduled three open houses every single Sunday and took one weekend off a month. So I was doing nine open houses and I got all of my buyers off of those open houses and I just stayed in touch with those people. So two, when I started on my own, I went back to those people and just said, hey, I'm on my own. So I think you look at your critical contacts, 
who are your biggest cheerleaders and go back to those people to, to see, hey, do you know of anybody looking to buy, sell, or invest in real estate? So that's what's worked for me. Off of what Caroline was, or Carolyn was saying there, you have to really create a community. I mean, if you need people to trust you, and trust is the most important thing right now, I think, especially when everybody's scared. They need somebody that they not only know about, maybe have heard about, but they trust you. And what drives trust is, number one, finding that one thing and pushing what you're really good at really hard, finding that niche that you love to do and pushing that so that that community that, I mean, if everybody likes you, you're not doing something right. You got to have, you got to find your niche and polarize those people that really will follow you and trust you. So find that niche, push that, create the community around that and be consistent with it. So if you have an idea, maybe I'm going to call my database of my community you have to do that. I mean, you have to commit yourself to that because those people, if you just touch them once and then they don't hear back from you, or if you do one video and you don't do anything else for a few months, they're not going to think that you're consistent. I mean, whatever you decide on, keep that consistent because that drives trust. That's why people will love you, will follow you, will be part of your community. And then when this shift, you know, when we're out of this Corona pandemic here, and people are going, I'm going to go with that realtor that made me part of their community and that I loved and followed because he spoke to me and the people that I know, and he was always there, like always doing what he does best. So yeah, drive thanks. that trust, I, be consistent. I yeah. have an idea for um, getting, uh, can I talk now? Yeah, go ahead, Linda. Sorry. I moved yeah. in the office. Maybe I have a better signal. Sorry about there that. There okay. Um, I get about 90, between 90 and 93% of my business is referrals. And so I think it's really, really important to have testimonies, but to really, really sincerely believe in yourself and what you're doing, because that will come out and people want to um, snag on to success. Even if you're feeling like, I don't even know if this is gonna happen, you can't let everyone know that. Um, where I would start, and I've really, really been way past start on this, is belong to clubs and organizations that have meaning. Right now, I am on a rotary group that um, they, we did a Zoom meeting and we brainstormed on what we can do. And so we decided to um, call shut-ins, people that are, you can't go anywhere, that are elderly. And we developed a, a little program on that. So just think of all those people that I'm calling because I want to just have a conversation with them. Just tell me who are they going to call when they need a real estate agent when they sell their house. Um, and I'm not asking for real estate. I'm not talking about real estate. I'm just being kind in a fearful environment. And if you're genuine that way, that's how you start building your uh, referrals and your testimonies. Idea. Yeah, thank you. All right, you guys, let's, um, we're going to answer uh, Aaron's last question. Uh, and just to kind of wrap things up, uh, we'll do a few uh, ahas and we're going to be, we'll be done right at noon here. But um, uh, I, how, how are you guys leading your team? Oh, go ahead, Ben. Well, I was just going to say, um, and building off the community thing, um, <clears throat> what we're actually doing is we're going and we're calling the other small businesses in our community and we're buying gift cards hoping that um, when we do come out of this will be the real estate professionals that they recommend or they call when they need. So we're trying to support them in these hard times too, because obviously with the bars and the restaurants and all that being shut down, even if it's not much, you know, 30, 50 bucks. Um, so that's what we're doing. Yeah. No, that's awesome. I, Great tactic. Yeah. Go ahead, Brandy. Um, that's awesome. And one other cool thing too, if you're not, maybe you're already doing it, but just uh, food for thought is while you're, while you're making those business calls, you can ask if it's okay um, for you to promote them on your Kelly insights and add them to your local insights. And then that is a great way to build that and give them and just say, look, it's just extra exposure for your business as well. Um, you know, I can put a little message about you at this time, uh, just for some extra promotion. 
Awesome. Very good. Thank you. All right. Um, so the last question uh, Aaron had was leading your team. How are you guys leading your team right now? Um, thoughts, tips, tricks, um, how you led a team through the last shift. How are you leading them now? Uh, what do you guys got? All right. We're doing, we're oh, doing a Zoom call every day at eight. So I get together with my assistant and my buyer's agent and we do a Zoom call every day at eight. Um, it's 15 minutes and we pray. We talk about our big rocks. And then we check in at 1145 and talk about our wins. And maybe a win is getting a health score to 100% right now. Maybe it's not setting an appointment. Um, but we're checking in three times a day so we can, you know, stay connected and no one gets off track. Awesome. Great. Yes. Communication in a shift is huge. The more you can communicate, um, the better. That's, that's awesome. Thanks, Nelly. One of the things we did, Caleb, we got real transparent with our financials with our team to let them know that we're solid, that we're not going anywhere. Um, here's what we're doing to contain our expenses. Here's the investments we're making to um, innovate through this. Uh, we're making investments around uh, technology, uh, obviously the remote technologies. Uh, going back into our processes in the back office, making sure they're geared for the new world and going down, getting our CEs out of the way so that when we come out of this, we're gonna be all rocking and rolling. No, I appreciate that. How did the, when you, when you had that conversation with them, Brian, with your team and exposed the finances to them, you kind of said what you're doing, you kind of created the safe environment. How did, how was it perceived? How did they feel after that? Well, they felt fine. And, and it wasn't a new thing. I mean, we, we show, we share our financials every month with the team, but what we did is we went into the, um, you know, the cash burn, like you discussed yesterday, we identified our runway uh, with no incoming income at all, how long we could survive and then we went into what we're going to do to even further knock down expenses and constraints so that we could make investments in the new technology. I mean, the, the, the employee that we have was fearful, obviously, when this all started. And I think that alleviated her fears very, very much because, I mean, everybody's on deck. They're, they're moving forward. And, and you know, I think they're happy with that. Awesome. No, thank you. It's just like when emotion gets high, you guys have all had a listing or a buyer that emotion comes into the deal and the emotion spikes super high. They look to us all the time to basically bring logic, to bring that security, to say, I've got your back. This shift is no different. They're, they want to know from you. Your team wants to know from you. They want to know that you kind of have their back. You're working on this. You're sharing the financials. You're sharing some of the decisions. You're saying, this is an uncertain time for me as a leader. Be transparent with them. And then just say, these are the steps that we're taking, right, wrong, or indifferent. This is the direction we're going. And you can count that all together. We're going to do the best that we can and come out of this thing pretty strong. Um, so thank you guys for that. All right, we got a few minutes. Um, give me some ahas of what you guys picked up from these, uh, from the people sharing and um, adding value. What'd you guys pick up? My biggest aha is the scooping up the properties. I've often said that if I were to get, get into real estate for, as a new person today versus when I did get into it, the opportunity is in acquiring properties and building wealth. I have no idea how I would do that, but I am open to learning. So I really think that's my big aha. Like, hmm, how can I be doing more of that? The time is here again. Um, potentially could be here again to get some amazing deals. Yes, awesome. Mm -hmm. What other ahas did you guys pick up? I think uh, one thing that I, I picked up is that, you know, um, I have these assistants that are doing things and they are not that busy. So I'm going to um, start um, asking them to do what they can to get get us into some doors um, yeah. buyers and sellers and it's really a lot of times we just ask them for help they want to help right now they're feeling kind of helpless as it is and there's a lot of fear and you giving them a task like hey help us get into some doors we need your help with that and all of a sudden it gives them a new light gives them some fresh energy um, uh, for that I'm gonna read off a couple that I had um, Linda and Jerry said a lot of people lay down during this time you can obviously tell nobody here is on the calls laying down now. Uh, Reread the one thing. Um, do what others are not doing from Linda. Uh, Kim said, get back to your database. Jerry said, look for a three to four times investment on any line item that is in my profit and loss. Anything I'm spending money on, look for a three to four times investment. Sandra said, lean into what you're good at. Um, get out of your comfort zone. Susan said, get back to your database. However much lead generation you are doing, whatever form of lead generation you're doing, uh, double down on it, uh, ask great questions, 3D tours, Matterports, these different things are um, helping do business in today's environment. Um, communicate three times a day with your team from Nelly. And then um, wish we invested more from Sandra and Susan, I believe you also mentioned that. So um, 
You guys, I uh, hope you got value out of today's call. We're going to end right now. Um, if this is something you guys want to continue, please message myself. Please message uh, Laura Thompson, your team leaders. If you guys got value out of this, we'll do uh, everything we can to deliver content, deliver value in uh, different ways than we have in the past. And uh, this is interesting. I, I, I learned a lot. And thank you all for participating today. Thanks, Caleb. Thank you. All right. Caleb. Thanks, guys. Thank Go out and get them. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much.